I'm here today at Splash uh, interviewing Nada Amin, a researcher at EPFL in uh, Lausanne, and Ross Tate, at, uh, who is an assistant professor at Cornell University in the US. So uh, my first question for you is, um, Nada and Ross, you both have a, or together have a paper at Uppsala, which is about the, the fact that the Java and Scala type systems are unsound. So can you tell us what that means? And can you tell something about how you discovered this fact? So soundness, uh, first a type system, what, what, what a type system gi give you is a guarantee that some, some things in your program will never happen. And you can have this guarantee without even running your program, just by a quick check, which the compiler does. And it can reject your program if it's wrong. And so. What, what soundness is about is really that actually you thought you had a guarantee, but you don't really have it. And so this is what we, we are, we, this is what the paper is about, that uh, we, we expected a certain guarantee that if, if you program in a certain style, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a certain kind of error, but not even in a certain style, just if you just program in Java, you wouldn't have certain kind of errors. And our paper showed that you can still have these kinds, these kinds of errors. Okay, uh, and so how did you discover this? Oh, yeah, right. So the, the discovery part, uh, for me, it was mostly as, as part of my PhD work with uh, Martin Odersky. I, I was breaking the Scala compiler all the time. Uh, it was just part of like the kind of the instant gratification you get when, when working on, uh, on, on the project, like just to, to tell to Martin, hey, this doesn't work, hey, this doesn't work. And then you, you get a discussion like this about the design, uh, iterating on design and, and, uh, and how to get a sound design. And then when I presented my work at a, at a fun working group um, in Los Angeles, Ross was, in, was also in this working group, and he asked me, what if you add null to, to, your, to your little language? Will it, will it, break, uh, will it break? And he, he also likes to break languages, so, so that's why he asked this question. And then I was like, yes, of course it will break in this way. And he's like, oh, let's break Scala in this way. And I was like, yeah, but you know, Scala has all these ad hoc checks to prevent this. And, and, and then I was like, but in 15 minutes, we broke it. And he was, he was very happy. <laughs> and I was okay, one more, you know, it's not a big deal. Like, yeah. <laughs> but then actually when, uh, I think on the flight back, uh, Ross actually found the same issue in Java. And that was a much bigger deal because, because Java didn't seem to have the kind of features that would cause this, this, this problem in the first place. Thank you. And uh, so it seems that you can get uh, erroneous programs without actually being at fault yourself uh, because of the compiler doesn't catch some errors. Uh, is, that, is that sort of something that matters in practice, uh, Ross? So in soundness, um, so we're lucky in our system that like, Java and Scala both compile to the Java virtual machine. And the Java virtual machine has its own mini language, the Java bytecode, which so far seems to be sound. And so as a consequence, this translation ends up catching the bug at runtime. So the Java virtual machine catches it. But had we changed history and actually made the Java virtual machine be changed when you added generics, then the Java virtual machine would also be unsound by our, our discovery. And that would imply that basically I could get full access to the memory in your computer because, I, well, besides the, operate, the systems that the operating system puts in place, but unless I could peek a bunch of data that should, I shouldn't be able to look at, I basically say treating or tricking the type system into thinking some data is an array and then be able to access that ad hocly rather than uh, through the guards that Java puts in. So you're saying this is also a security risk if this would have been the case. And uh, so, if, if, uh, if you look at other languages like Dart and Eiffel, uh, they are well known to be unsound. So is it, could you conclude that this soundness is just a theoretical thing or uh, does it really have impact on how you program in a day-to-day -day fashion? Uh, so it's more of like a choice. So if you're designing a language, you could say, I want this language to be sound or I don't care about soundness. Or maybe you have some middle ground. You care about certain kinds of soundness but not other kinds of soundness. All of those are fine decisions. What's important is that everyone knows what actually is the case. Because if I'm programming a language that I expect to be sound, then I'm not going to put in checks I would otherwise put in. And so if it turns out to be unsound, then people can break into my program, or my program would just have errors I wouldn't anticipate, and that can cause problems down the road. So Nada, you're a part of the Scala uh, core team, and you contribute to the, de the design of the language. So what can language designers do to avoid these problems in, in their programming language designs? 
Well, so so as 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 uh, as as Ross said, this also depends on what you what the trade off is that you're you're trying to do. And in my case, I like to work bottom up. So Martin Odersky very much has a, a big vision of what is important in terms of uh, he he has he has a um, like taste in terms of what he wants in a language. And in my case, what I really want is I I, I want to work from the bottom and say, okay, I know this works. I understand this very well, and now I want to add one more onion, and I know that this works, and I can reason about this. And, I, and at the end, I, I want to build it bottom up so that I know that it's sound on principle. And the reason why I care about this is because before doing my PhD, I was in industry, and I felt that there is an issue in terms of programming at scale. When you work in, really, in a really big software company, everyone is, is working on the same code base. It's really nice to have tools that are really fast, like the, that... Um, so, 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 so uh, type checkers, not uh, programs that, that, you, that you have to run and, and wait and see, okay, is this going to, to, to catch on fire or not? You, you really just want to, to, to reason, like think about it even almost on paper, like, like on your editor and think, okay, this is, I'm on the right track or not. And so for me, this is, this is what made me want to go back to, to, um, to graduate school, it's, it's more because I was working in, in infrastructure and tooling. It was more like, okay, I, I feel I need to understand the theory better to do better tools. And 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 actually now I, I it's true that I as I've done this, I've started to just like in general looking at a complex problem and try to 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 uh, look at it bottom up. So for me, then it has become more of a journey into a, a way of thinking about uh, about. Um, in general, uh, breaking complexity down and when, when you try to understand a problem. Thank you. So uh, I've read the paper, and I think one of the diagnoses uh, that you uh, make is that it's re related to feature interactions in, your, in, in a language design, and one of them is uh, the presence of null. And uh, this has been famously called the $1 billion mistake by to Sir Tony Hoare. So uh, my question to you, Ross, do you think that null will be eliminated from the programming languages of the future? So a number of languages are actually already get, well, getting rid of null in a sense. So the problem isn't necessarily null itself. The problem is having null be implicit. So that is, I can say I have a, a, some object of a class here, but actually it might be null, and I don't know that. So new languages are making it explicit. You have to, if it might be null, the type has to say, this thing might be null. Now the programmer knows how to, how to handle it and makes the interfaces clearer, especially for things like maps and lists and all these things that might have null involved. Um, and right now I know of three languages that are doing this, all of which are fairly new, uh, Ceylon, Kotlin, and Rust. And it's definitely a trend happening. Uh, Martin's actually been talking about maybe doing the same thing for Scala, partly because of what we found, but also because he doesn't like null pointers. Um, so I don't think it will be read entirely because it definitely has its uses, um, but I do think many more languages in the future will be getting, making it explicit at least. Thank you. So I have one final question for both of you. So you're both upcoming uh, uh, researchers in the programming language design community. So can you briefly tell me why programming language design and designing new programming languages is actually important? So uh, I feel I, I answered this a little bit earlier. Maybe, Ross, you want to? You yeah, so for me, so so for me, it's it's more as um, I, I think of a language as a you know, like kind of Alan Alan Kay's view of a, as a lens almost as a as a way of thinking. And so when I design a language, it's not particularly the language that I'm interested in. It's more like what what thoughts does it enable me to have that are quick, uh, like that 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 I like that are sound in some sense, in the sense that I can I can cut through, like it's kind of a lens, like a, a glasses that you put on. And, and now you can see the world where where you you're, you're now saying okay, um, I, with with this lens I, I can be very effective at doing this sort of work, and with this other lens I can be very effective at be doing this sort of work. So I think we will always have the curse of Babel, like the Tower of Babel, and where there will, there, will always, there will always be plenty of languages to choose from, and it's par partly um, adapting to your uh, to, to to your domain. Ross, so the language design. But we just talked about null pointers, for example, right? That design itself affects how we program regularly, and one small design, say, glitch or feature can significantly affect hundreds of programs, um, well, more than hundreds. Uh, and you can do some interesting things with language design. You can consider things like we could add, right? Maybe we could add security features to languages. We talked about security earlier. Or maybe you can make the language easy to learn, uh, to, to learn, so make it more accessible to people who aren't, say, professional programmers, but want to incorporate learning or programming into daily life as becoming a trend 
uh, with the, as the technology becomes more daily or regular. Um, yeah, sorry. Okay, so this was the interview with Nada Amin and Ross Tate from here at uh, the Splash Conference. Thank you both, and uh, we'll see each other again. Thank you.